Uh, we're going to discuss the U.S. OCIO. Um, we're just going to discuss our 2023 report that we had to put out earlier this year. Um, it's pretty comprehensive. It's a very high-level presentation. Uh, but given the size of our uh, both our virtual and in-person uh, group, I'm open to, to taking questions whenever during the presentation. Um, if you would like to go a little deeper or have, have any specific questions about, um, about our research. So just to get started, if you aren't uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, familiar with Israeli Associates, we are a 30-year-old market research and consulting firm for financial services. We are based here in Boston. Uh, many of you might have seen some of our extensive research and you use it in your work today. Uh, we, we cover the entire financial services industry, wealth management practices, retirement, product development. Michelle and I are part of the institutional research practice. Um, our research process is very comprehensive. We conduct dozens of surveys every year, as well as executive thousands of executive interviews. We have a really in-depth research process that we use to collect all of this information. Let's see. So um, we do consulting as well. Um, for our institutional practice, uh, we cover, we pretty much cover the entire institutional market. We do sizing, we do we quarterly periodicals to catch you up on some different topics within the industry. Um, we also have institutional asset owner surveys from both the general perspective and the exchange perspective, gaining insights on that, on that aspect of the market as well as with asset managers and, and providers. Um, let's see. We also cover the insurance general account market uh, within our institutional practice. Um, but today we're here to talk about OCIO. And most of you do probably know what OCIO is, but I just want to give a definition for one, anyone who doesn't know, and two, anyone who just want to, might understand the parameters that we're putting around it when we talk about this. So outsourced chief investment officer is simply a third party investment management entity that takes an institutional asset owner's portfolio, be it a pension or an endowment endowments, assets, foundations, health and hospital systems, and they take over and they manage the portfolio day to day, and they also have full discretion over the portfolio within the, within the guidelines that are set forth by the investment policy statement. Um, most, in most cases, they will do full discretion, but there are instances where they have partial discretion over the portfolio. You may see a full portfolio OCIO that manages the entire asset pool, and you may see sleeve portfolios, which are just managing certain asset classes. Typically, it would be the alternative private asset classes. Those are some of the ways that we see OCIOs as they exist. Um, they have been around for decades in some in some manner, very niche manner, uh, this, this sort of arrangement, but they really became more popular for particularly pensions around the great financial crisis of 2000 and 2009, when it became much more expensive and much more costly to have underfunded pension. Um, and what happened in that scenario is a lot of pensions that were working with their investment consultants turned to their investment consultants and ask them, could you manage this entire portfolio for us? So I want I want everyone to keep that in mind as we're talking about the industry that in the beginning, 15 years ago, when we really took off, um, there, there wasn't a lot of searching as much as just asking well, if uh, if you are able to, to, to do this for us. So you're taking, you know, this is fiduciary duty over an entire portfolio. And it's also important to understand that because of this, investment consultants and asset managers are Asset managers are some of the largest OCIO providers here in the United States, as well as globally. Um, so why would an organization choose an OCIO? So I mentioned just a minute ago that for the US, US pension system, there was a bit of overhaul and it just made it more of a liability to have to be managing this on your own. So this was done to, to, to for less expensive portfolio management. Um, the cost of having an in-house investment team could be quite costly, especially if you're a smaller firm. Um, so that was one reason why a lot of firms moved to OCIO. 
And then again, expertise in portfolio management and some of the various uh, investment capabilities that are interesting, things like liability driven investment, or pension risk transfer, ESG. Those are all things that you might not be able to get in house very, very efficiently. Um, and again, access to higher quality of investments, especially for private asset classes. For a lot of OCIOs, and we'll see this later, um, for a lot of um, clients of OCIOs, I should say, um, they tend to be rather small under $100 million, and that's not really an amount of money that can get you, uh, generally get you very good access to private equity, to, to certain alternatives. And so this is one of the ways that you get that access. Um, better portfolio governance. Um, you know, you have this third party that's independent, and they you're very experienced with portfolio management, and that can be really important, especially when you're dealing with smaller firms. Um, so another thing is help with investment committee education, and this is particularly important for endowments and foundations that might be looking for looking for OCIO um, as investment committees turn over uh, and new members come on. A lot of times the OCIO will provide education on different asset classes. They'll provide education on just what an OCIO relationship looks like. Um, and that can be very important. Access to nonprofit expertise. Um, a lot of these organizations can turn to an OCIO that might have their own foundation or their own fundraising. Um, Get some expertise in here as well. And then, from the perspective of the investment consultants and the asset managers that choose to work as MCIOs, um, they can definitely get higher fees for this type of service than they can for just traditional investment consulting or traditional asset management. And that's been a big benefit for them. Additionally, you tend to have what I would call stickier assets. Um, the relationship is less likely to end quickly, and you can get into that one of the factors. So before I get started with um, talking about the size of the market and expectations for growth, does anybody have any questions about what an OCIO is, either in the room or online? Yes, hi. Can you talk about why higher fees are not like why, why you list that as them getting higher fees as opposed to lower? Yes. So an investment consultant, right, when they typically have a relationship with a with an asset owner, it's um, it's for AUA, right? So so they're you know they're generating single digit basis points off of that. When you are working with an investment consultant, the higher fees are typically from investment management, managing the portfolio, and you'll see that the fees. We'll talk a little bit about the fees later, but you'll see that they're quite a bit higher than some of the fees that you can get for the very, um, very mature, um, very competitive investment services. Have you seen any firms um, sort of level out the differential between consulting and area? So on the margin, you can see some, particularly when you get into the really um, larger clients, right, from a client perspective, if you have a client that has $1 billion, $2 billion, five, one of those really big portfolios, you do start to see some leveling out. But uh, generally, because the, the client base still tends to be pretty small, and some other terms that are happening that we will talk about a little bit later, uh, they still tend to be higher. Um, so, so this is this slide. There's a lot going on, but I'll try to explain it as best I can. This is the this is what we expect to see in terms of AUM growth as a percentage of the different clients that exists in OCIO. So we have all different types of institutional clients that can use an OCIO, along with um, private wealth clients, which in surveys world we consider them more of a, a retail client. So um, so it's, it's, it's kind of a new area for us that we're looking at, but um, what you want to know is that in 2022, um, the dark bar at the bottom, that 44.1%, that is the, the AUM share for corporates and life benefit plans, which again, they have been the biggest user of the OCIO model historically. So this isn't a surprise that they tend to be very large asset 
And as you can see, we have some smaller birds up top here to find contribution, endowments, foundations. Uh, but what's important to note is that if you look, while there is absolute growth in that bottom, that dark blue bar for corporate defined benefit plans, you can see as a percentage of the overall market share, it is shrinking. And there's a couple of different factors. Uh, I think for the first time, endowments and foundations are really um, are, are starting to look at OCIO more than they did before for a lot of the same reasons that um, pensions did the big financial crisis. 2020, we saw a lot of changes in how different endowments and foundations had to operate. They started to see some operational risks in their model, particularly um, the way their revenues, if you can think about like a um, endowment for college, for example. Uh, they were particularly stressed because students were no longer on campus and all of those sort of revenues that happened from the daily operations of a campus. That were suddenly shut off. So, so they started to see different risks that maybe weren't aware that they had before. Um, additional, yes. Does that growth assume just uh, market growth in the assets? So, no. market value, so that assumes no, like a zero return on the assets. So, this, there is market, um, there are market return assumptions built into this as well as future adoption. So, so in terms of numbers, so if we look at this over the next five years going out, we are looking at a growth rate of about 10.5% annually overall. So we're starting out that 2022 numbers around 2.4 trillion, and we're going to just about 3 trillion by the end of 2027. Yes. To expand on the retail element, specifically in sector, a subsector, I guess. Yes. Absolutely. So, so this is a very niche area of the market right now, and it's it's really hard to define because I think as, as any of us that are aware of OCIO, we know that definitions of what OCIO is can be um, can be hard to can be very hard to track down. Uh, but in terms of what we tried to capture, uh, we're looking at any of the like investment consultants that already have OCIO. And that they're bringing, um, they're sort of creating their model to fit into a retail like that. But instead of, if you think about an RIA that might like have a, a, they have a shelf of products that they can use and they're making the decisions on what goes into the end client's portfolio, they're not doing that anymore in an OCIO model that's happening at that third party OCIO. Um, that's generally what we're trying to capture. Um, in some cases, there are private wealth firms that are doing something that looks a little bit like OCIO from their perspective, but that's generally what we're talking about. Um, and it's growing quickly off of a very tiny piece. So, um, so when we see that high growth number, we have to remember that that's likely to come down in the future. Yes. The private wealth done in family offices, or is that pretty much still all done in house? So we're still we're including family offices in this as well. Again, it's it can be difficult to make that distinction between is this just your typical um, offering that you would have in a multifamily office, or is this there's some aspect of this that's highly institutional quality um, that you wouldn't necessarily get in a private office. So yeah, it's it's a it's so you know these are my expectations. I think depending on who you ask and what their assumptions are, they might have different. As well, so I think that's something important to remember. <clears throat> okay, so any more questions on the, the market sizing and growth expectations? So, again, I just wanted to reiterate there is, um, while the, the corporate defined benefit plans are a smaller portion, they are still growing on an absolute basis. <clears throat> now, the next thing that I want to point out about the OCIO model, and I think many of you are aware of this as I've mentioned a couple of times already, is that this typically, um, the, the typical client has been historically very small institutions, those that have less than $100 million. Running an in-house investment firm for, for you know, in-house investment team for those size clients can be really difficult. So from a cost perspective alone, the OCIO makes a lot of sense. That being said, we're seeing a lot of growth in that 101 million to one billion dollars and that's because not only is it cost effective there's also just a lot of benefits for the 
appreciate your duty for access to better investments, to speed of investment decision making. Um, so, so again, when we're looking at growth. Yes, we see a lot of one hundred million dollar clients. But we are seeing a lot of growth in that big market as well. Any questions here? And this, as you can see on the left side, the, the dark blue bars. That's um, those are the total portfolio mandates. Well, on the uh, the lighter blue are the sleep portfolios that I've mentioned, where it might only be just the alternative investment class. Um, so as you can see, really large clients with total A or above a billion dollars are, are like more likely to outsource um, for, for a sleep portfolio, and that has a lot. And that's a big reason for that. There's, a bit, there's so much differentiation there. <clears throat> okay. Laura? Yes. It seems weird to have a sleeve in OCIO. Can you just like talk about? Of course. What, and maybe a little later, or yeah. but maybe this is a good time to just talk about what that actually looks like. Yes. Why they would do that? Why? They, yeah, absolutely. Uh, usually, so that sleeve of OCIO will likely be certain asset classes. It's likely going to be your private equities, uh, really niche alternatives. Ones that require a lot of expertise, a lot of um, a lot of talent, and that can be really hard to 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 acquire on one team. So it makes a lot of sense, especially if you're smaller, um, getting access to those types of investments and for, for just good governance practices. You want to have some stuff. Do you believe you get better access if you're in an OCIO model? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so better access is better to certain investment asset classes, and specifically those private asset classes, private equity. If you're really small, um, it, you know, that's, that's going to be a barrier for you to, to really invest in that institutional quality. But you have an opportunity simply because OCIOs are working with multiple small clients to have pooled investments in those areas. So that's, that's a big draw for a lot, especially in foundation space. Do, do most OCIOs have those investment opportunities? Depending on their client type, if they're looking at endowment and foundation clients that are typically smaller, um, they will. There's certain ones like, for example, Vanguard isn't really <laughs> isn't really any longer, but you know they didn't really have that. So um, you know the markets, depending on who your clients are and who you're trying to target, um, that may or may not be what you're going to see. But in general, a lot of OCIs do have some sort of tools, um, alternative, private equity. Yes. Yeah. Um, so these are an area of the, of the OCIO market that are very challenging. And the reason for this is, as I've mentioned before, it's an, it's an entire, it's not only portfolio management, it's all of the due diligence, all of the research, all of the operations, anything, anything that goes with managing an investment team in-house is now being happening somewhere else. That's very expensive. So, um, you know, when you're working with an investment consultant, you're only talking about the investment management fee and the investment consultant, not all of the other fees. So how does an OCIO tell a client they're going to be charged for services and what you'll see is a wide variety of different ways to quote it some will just give you an all-in number and say 120 basis points 200 basis points all in others will break it down more for you and what we found is that um i don't have that slide in here well in any case um could you take a Oh, sure. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Come on. Just give me a minute. Okay. Sorry. Excuse me. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle. Uh, I work closely with Laura and used to cover the OCI space. Uh, so I'm not sure what side she was looking for, um, but I think she was just kind of talking about how different OCI providers offer different fee arrangements. Nearly all of them, um, or in this case, all of the um, OCIOs that we survey offer a basis point fee arrangement on 
assets under management. Um, some clients, some specific client types, um, often want a flat fee, and we typically see that in the pension space. Um, and then if you look at some of the dedicated OCIO shops like the Investor, um, they will also um, have some element of a performance-based fee um, on top of um, the other, the management fee. Um, so, okay, here it comes more. Um, let's see what's next. Okay. Um, and are you all set? Yeah, I think okay. um, I'll like to take a quick. I'm just going to sit a little bit lower. Oh, uh, is there a way for us to move the camera down a little bit? My apologies, everyone. So we were talking about um, we were talking about advisory fees and how they're quoted in all different ways. And I take a lower seat. Um, so when we're talking about these lower fees, so you can have a couple of different models, and you mentioned that generally most. OCIO providers will offer a basis points of AUM fee, but then they'll have fixed fees for clients that are uh, larger, like a $1 million plus client, and not going to just do a basic AUM fee. Um, sometimes we'll see performance based fees, not as common. Uh, you do see performance based fees for, uh, uh, let's see, clients with private equity. <laughs> we talk a lot about private equity here. Um, so then, for this, this is just the advisory fee piece. I was talking about how coded all the different things. So we we ask um, various OCIO providers, um, you know, what are, you know, if you're just looking at your advisory fee, so that's going to be all of your due diligence and your research, um, you know, what is, what are the average fees? And these are broken down by corporate defined benefit plans, which are going to be heavy income portfolios, and then your nonprofit clients, which are going to be um, a little bit more heavy in various asset classes. And as you can see, um, it, what I like to talk about this slide is that um, at different asset levels, you have a really like about a 20 basis point range that most clients are going to fall into. And that's that's a result of the last 15 years. There's been a lot more understanding of the model, a lot more um, competition between firms. So we are seeing fees sort of come down a little bit narrow. Um, I don't think they're going to come down a lot more from where they are right now because I think there is a lot of um, good competition right now. Um, so yeah, so, so this, is, this is what we see right now. Again, when you're looking at a billion dollars, you start to see less than 10 basis points on average, and that's simply because you have a lot of left built into that. Well, I mean, it, yeah. it sounds like you're saying that most, a lot of that Difference between corporate DB and nonprofit is asset allocation related in a sense. Is some of it also just scale? Like, do they just tend to be larger too, or are they actually pretty equal? So I think. Kind of think about the display of size. Yeah, I mean, so we are already breaking it down by the size of the client. So I do think this has more to do with those asset allocation decisions. If you are mostly in fixed income, that's a pretty easy asset class to do investment management, due diligence, and research. But, you know, a nonprofit client has a lot more. Uh, to what extent are you seeing clients select advisors based on fees? I guess how no. important. <laughs> well, fees are always going to be important, but I, I would say that there's a lot more that goes into the decision to hire an OCI than the fee will allow. They're going to want to look at your expertise, and keep in mind this is a really, uh, a really intertwined relationship. Right, this is just like. Having an having an investment consultant make a decision for you on a couple of portfolios. They're managing the whole thing. Um, so you want people that are going to be able to get on the phone with you. The customer service element, the communication element is going to be very important. The expertise that the organization brings is going to be very important. You want to feel, especially when you're working with the larger firms, that you and your hundred million, hundred and fifty million dollar portfolio are going to be important enough to. To, to talk to. Um, so fees, again, important, but that element of the relationship also is a big deal. Okay, 
one important thing to talk about in the um, in the OCIO space that is a little bit different than pretty much the entire rest of the institutional space is the reliance on active strategies. Um, certainly, passive strategies are used, but as you can see here, about two thirds of the overall AUM for the clients that we surveyed are in active management strategies. Another 22% are in these hybrid strategies, which are some combination of different indexing, people based investing plus and active fees, and only about 15% are purely passive. Those are typically your more efficient asset classes, large cap growth equity, where you're not going to get a lot of value. So you just save money and spend that somewhere else. And I assume that it has a lot to do with private asset classes, I'm like. Also, yes, that is also true. So, um, so this does factor that in as well. But it just even in the active space, even in the institutional space, there's there they use more more so than you would see in the general space. Conflicts of interests, there are many. Um, there's very little regulation on how to show your fees, how to show your performance. We'll be definitely talking about here is doing a lot to to bring some guidelines around that. Um, so yeah, fee comparisons between OCI providers, as well as those factors we talked about where there's many moving parts are really challenging for an OCIO provider. It's, you know, are we presenting ourselves in the most um, the most competitive light to our to our potential clients? Um, increased competition amongst OCIO providers. And again, asset owners are becoming more aware of the model. And they're spending more time than not just going out anymore and saying, can you be my, um, can you act as an OCI over me? They're looking at multiple firms. They're asking questions about what model they have. Um, what, is, what is our relationship going to look like? Um, there's competition. Um, conflicts of interest. This is, this is one that comes up a lot, and it's highly debated among OCIO firms. Um, what, what conflicts, one, the biggest conflict of interest that we see is when asset managers that are acting as OCIOs heavily use their proprietary product in their OCIO model. That's a question of are you providing uh, the proper amount of fiduciary duty? Uh, and you know, firms that do this will say, well, you know, it's an option, you can opt out of that. They'll say, you know, we you know we make sure that it's that it's in the best interest of the client. So in general, there's you see it both ways. So there's no way you can opt that. Um, another thing to talk about is the amount of market concentration that's been going on. Um, over time, we've seen mergers and acquisitions in this space. Um, this year, we found 117 firms that have, um, that offer OCIO requests. And what you see here is a map of just how concentrated it is. This is the total AUM, 117 firms, the top 10 have just over 50% of all of the AUM. Um, and then the bar directly to the to the right of that, that's gonna be your top 20%, uh, or I should say the 10 to 20%, and that's another 23%. Bottom left, bottom right, excuse me. That's numbers 21 through 30, they're, they added, they're an additional 87%. Everyone from 31 to 117, so, yes. So, who are the top names? Some of the top OCIO firms that you see are some of the top investment firms. So, you see Mercer, you see Goldman Sachs, you see Russell. Um, I could, you know, we have a list of that and I can provide that for you. And it depends again how you're looking on it, um, you know, both globally and from the Fidelity. Fidelity is not in the top, um, not the top 10, no. Um, but they are. They are uh, part of that hundred Yes. So this is uh, based on asset size. Yes. Do you have a similar measurement for number of clients? Because if you have a huge, you know, sort yeah. of health fund or big, you know, fund benefit plan, this would be skewed. I don't have that direct, but yes, I think you know that's um, that's a good question, right? And it's going to depend a little bit on the client type as well. So. Um, so the reason I'm focusing on AUM level um, is simply because
because we see so many firms that, that seem to be trying to gather assets um, and, and acquire assets and bigger and broader in terms of total scale. We saw that recently with Mercer acquiring most of Vanguard. And then we saw, and I would say this was less about AUM growth as much as it was about, um, about just um, broadening uh, access to different client sites. And that was between Sari partners and G. Um, so, so we, 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 over time, we've seen more of those, and there have been a lull for a couple of years, and then we just stopped continuing. So, um, again, it's, it's important to note that and one of the reasons we talk about this is that um, when that happens, clients tend to get a little bit, or potential clients and even existing clients tend to get a little bit nervous about what the future OCI relationship might look like. Um, so, in the instance where you're looking at potential clients, there's likely going to be a period of months to two years, where it's going to be really difficult to acquire clients after a merger because they are nervous about that culture and what the investment opportunities look like. Uh, it's also a period time period where existing clients might start looking around and saying, is this the right relationship for us again? So really important to remember that as a new thing. Basically, this is basically off of that trillion that I mentioned earlier. Um, so again, so, so you know, if we're looking at 50% of it's like one trillion. Um, so yeah, it's um it's very hard to do. Um, so one of the areas that's very interesting is um, ESG has been a big topic in the industry for a while. And the reason I bring it up is most OCIOs offer a lot of capabilities in ESG support and they have that Resources. When we talk to them, they tell us that very few of their clients have a have a fully formed ESG uh, plan. So, so they're almost kind of sitting on the sidelines, and they just want to know that when we if we decide and when we decide to integrate ESG into our portfolios, is this firm going to be able to do that? So, I think this is probably one of the one of the, the more interesting aspects is just how capable they are for, for ESG, but how little it's actually going to be in its um, You know, that can certainly change in the future, but but just an important thing to know. And this is especially important to now that more now that the foundations are moving into the space, they tend to have more interest in ESG than the, the energy use. So, um, so the other thing that I wanted to talk about is over the last maybe seven or eight years, we've seen a number of small organizations and even individuals uh, come onto the scene to conduct what I would call an OCI search. So you call them search consultants. And they come in for either an existing or a new asset owner looking at OCI for the first time, and they help them go through all of these aspects, right? So again, you know, we're looking at what are the fees going to look like, what the service is going to look like, where the asset class options are going to have the performance, what's the performance look like. This is all part of what a search consultant is. There's about 40 of them that I know of, and on any given year, uh, we see a couple of firms leave and a couple of firms leave. These are, in some cases, they are very established firms that might offer other uh, types of financial services, support services, um, you know, performance uh, reviews, that type of thing. Um, some of them are consultants, but maybe don't do investment consulting themselves. Others are semi-retired and just, um, you know, they have decades of experience and they're able to help um, certain certain typically small endowments and foundations to find out how can. So, um, you know, what's important to know is that while there's only a few of them and they're helping smaller clients, they, they've made quite a bit of, they have had quite a bit of influence over the industry in terms of um, looking at how, what is the performance like, you know, if an OCIO client will, will share performance based on, you know, maybe one one client or on their asset class performance history. But search consultants will come in and say, we want to look at it a couple of different ways so that we can compare it to other firms. And um, so they've, they've had a lot of influence over that specific relationship. Um, so again, something to be aware of 
for you know SCIO and for the NASA culture system out in the community. So instead of setting out an RFP and search agency. Yeah, they, the search consultant would would conduct the RFP process for them. So a, a search consultant would say, well, what are you looking for? What is it that you need? What is your IPS statement? Do you have an IPS statement? I mean, in some cases, that is it's really rudimentary, depending on the client. So um, then they can go out. And the other thing is, they tend to know more about the landscape itself. So where um, your individual client might only know about Mercer, might only know about BlackRock, and maybe the one firm that their friend works at, um, the, 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 the search consultant should be able to copy that um, from that scope. Do you need to just really um, collect stats on the consultant or the intermediary in terms of who are the biggest, who are the most involved, um, you know, the same way that you do the clients? So we do some research into that. We do talk with search consultants, um, and we, we get accountable. We, we speak to about 25% of them. So I'm speaking to someone who can help them on any given year. Um, and, you know, we get in, we get some insight into their particular process. Um, it's really idiosyncratic, right? So you'll have some people that are literally one person that do five, eight searches a year, and then others that are actually a consultant, some type of consultant firm that they're not part of the In general, it, it tends to be pretty small. It's not particularly scalable or, um, or even lucrative for a lot. And a lot of them will tell me that it's, it's part of something that they're doing to help the client grow. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's very interesting because it is so small, it is so idiosyncratic. Just how much you can add over the industry. And when you talk about idiosyncratic, or it could be like a one person, you can have two people. Yep. Or do they have to be registered, or are they like registered with anybody or anybody? I mean, anyone could theoretically hold themselves out as a search consultant, but I think you would, you would need someone that has a significant amount of, I have not seen too many people that do have a significant amount of industry experience try to do that. Um, you would hopefully become apparent pretty quickly to any client or anyone for an OCI or working with them um, just with how knowledgeable they are. Um, so I haven't seen anything um, too untoward in that sense. <laughs> yes. Will there be an increase in the number of search consultants in the U.S. versus worldwide in the coming years, or is it going to stay at this number uh, and remain kind of constant? So that's that's really hard to tell, um, and the reason is again, you'll see people leave and come in. It's it's a group of people that again, a lot of the people that are doing this are individuals that are semi-retired. Um, some are doing it in between other jobs. So you see people like, do this for a while, they'll leave, see someone else come in. Uh, over the last five years, I haven't seen a, a big increase in this number. Again, it's, it's not a scalable business. It's something that's not very lucrative, depending on, on their business model. So um, so I don't expect a huge growth But I do expect they're all over the place. So it sounds pretty cottagey on the search consultant side with individuals and some IVs that mm -hmm. they're like a cottage in the industry. It's right? cottage industry. How do those search consultants engage with the potential asset owner that is potentially looking for new scenario? Is this sort of like, you know, I know a friend who knows a friend kind of situation? Or in some cases, yes. <laughs> um, not always. I think that, that asset owners have more aware of the OCIO model and they will seek out people to help them. So, um, so it's not always friends, but it's it's typically just like all of institutional asset management. There's typically I know somebody, I know somebody, and so there's not a lot of um, advertisements, right? Like some of them don't even have websites, which most of them isn't. So um, yes, it is it's it is a cottage industry. It is surprising that um, such a person or entity would come in and actually then do an RFP and something you know that's very sort of professional looking and mm -hmm. search, but they themselves don't know. So that's just a thing. 
Well, I, you know, in, in some cases they have, they are very well known in the industry. Again, if you probably have 30 years at a pension or, or you know, an investment consultant. So they're well known, in, they're, they're known in the industry and not the way they necessarily have to. Uh, some do, uh, but it is just, um, yeah, very interesting part. Um, again, placement. So one of the things that we see um, go to the search consultant for is what we, what we call a placement solutions. Sometimes an OCIO client will wonder, um, is this the best fit for me? We're not, some of the reasons they'll, they'll cite for it is um, we're not too happy with performance. Is this really what we should be, what we should be making? The service model isn't quite what we expected. Um, patients not agree. Be, a, in some cases, it's just we want to see what else is out there. We did this 10 years ago and just whatever. So, what else is out there for us? Um, and again, it can also be if the, the firm is merged, uh, just a little bit worried about that. Um, so, replacement searches uh, are expected to either remain the same or remain the same. And you know, we see this with firms, but those that are using search consultants to do this. In many cases, the search consultant will um, cut them down from doing a replacement search. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Typically, um, typically it's, it's very hard to move all of those assets to the firm. Unwinding these relationships can be extremely difficult. That's why the assets are just sticky as well. Um, so they don't do it lightly. And the search consultants, with all of their knowledge, really really make this a very well-known um, experience. Um, so, so in general, they are keeping this number down and for good reason. Search consultants can also go back to the OCIO and renegotiate aspects of the relationship that might need to be changed. Maybe, maybe it's a fee change. Maybe it is some type of service or change or reporting. So that's that's one of the reasons that um, you know, replacement searches are on the rise a little bit, but they are being temporarily limited by this increase as well. So, do you tend to see this skew based on market market performance? Yeah. And the twenty twenty three is like a nice little. Factory. Yes, <laughs> I think I I think that yes, there is definitely a little bit of um, anxiety on the part of uh, of certain clients that maybe weren't as concerned with things like risk management before. If you look at, you know, if you're thinking about an endowment that just had a, you know, CPI plus five by the benchmark, that was really easy for a long time and got really difficult. So that's a time when they might be thinking we need to go with a new OCI provider or, or we just realize just how busy this is. Do we need someone that can better manage this? So those are all absolutely that was a that is a big factor in mind. Yeah. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about today, um, before I open it up to just whatever question you have, is, um, is performance track records. So this is the result of our survey that show um, what are the ways that you as an OCIO provider quote for your performance track records to potential clients. 52% um, say that they have some type of deposit, but it's not in any way um, Gibbs compliant or, or you know, it's not a Gibbs composite. Um, we only see about, uh, let's see, 39% that say they do. And this is a number not based on any map. It's just, it's just a straight number. Um, track records of comparable clients. Um, and they, there's multiple ways that they can do this. So there's no one way that an OCIO is, is showing clients how, what performance looks like. They show them in multiple ways. And that's simply because their relationships are too tailored to the Clients, and you really can't. It's much more difficult to compare it to 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 clients that have been or have five years that might have something completely different in their investment policy statement. Um, so, of the 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 that's sixty one percent. Am I getting that right? Sixty one percent that are not uh, that are not showing gifts reports. About thirty seven percent were working on. Clients in the next 20 months. The complicating factor to this chart 
that while we were doing this survey, the, the, uh, the CFA Institute put out a working draft of performance track of, of, of Gibbs composites for OCIO. Um, it is just a working draft, and I'm sure many of you have seen it and read it. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what we learned from OCIO providers, um, from the CFA Institute um, over the last six months. Um, so this is a very um, all moving target, but um, you know, there was no consensus funding for firms on, on the OCI address. So what were your opinion on the standard that we set down? Um, about one in three said yes, we, we approve of the current proposal as is. Another 28% said that there are elements that they do not approve of or that they don't understand, so they're going to make public comments. 21% there's something that we don't understand or don't agree with, but we're not going to make public comments. And then we had a 21% say other, and a lot of those were we didn't have a chance to read them fully yet. Um, again, this was all very much in motion while we were conducting this research. And so, so there's still a lot of unknowns. And one of the reasons for the unknowns that we learned is is that there's some confusion over how to define certain assets within the different asset classes. So for anyone who's read them, there's there's two of them. You can basically divide any composite for an OCIO into two different categories. One is for return seeking and one is more of an asset liability matching, right? So so you're gonna have those that, that are protections, they're gonna be in, in one type of composite where your endowments and foundations are likely gonna be in that in more return seeking category. And then so the, the within those categories, there's different um, different levels of risk seeking and return within each. Uh, risk seeking and risk mitigating um, from like maybe twenty percent, sort of maybe twenty percent increments. And one of the challenges is you have to, as a firm, as an OCIO, classify each asset class as either return seeking or risk mitigating within each composite. So there's a lot of confusion about how to do that. Um, and, and, and my guess is that is what they are working on right now. Um, so in terms of expected implementation, uh, and I'm, this is what we collected from clients, but I'm going to uh, pretty give my own two cents on this side. But you know, most firms are say are waiting about 52%. So they're going to wait to see that kind of draft before they decide what they want to do with it. Um, you know, firms, um, you know, some about one in three are going to implement regardless. And, you know, other 3% said unlikely. We had some 14% basically that we don't know. Um, but in, in my opinion, based on what I've, what I've read, talk to people, I would say that the vast majority of the top 10 and top 20 would likely be, uh, likely be gets compliant in the future. Um, once these standards are in place. Um, so I've already mentioned, what is the time frame of when you feel like you're going to be a good understanding? I think we have to wait for the final draft. I'm not sure about when that is coming. I haven't seen that yet. Um, once you have it final draft, I would I would assume that after that, you're going to pretty good understanding. People are going to have a pretty good understanding of where their firm stands and what they plan to do. I don't think that's, um, I don't think it's going to be. Um, but I would say that among the top 20 firms, you are likely to see um, most of them, if not all of them, adopt GIPS. Uh, there will be holdouts, and there will be holdouts potentially in the, the, the top 10 and top 20, but especially in that scale, that long tail that we saw. Um, a lot of them are not seeking new clients. Uh, they, they, again, they can be really small. They're not seeking new clients. They don't feel like their clients are interested in GIPS. It's not going to be an important factor for them. So, um, so again, I expect it to be adopted by a lot of firms. So, so, so that's pretty much the everything that I have prepared. But again, it's really high level for a very complicated, very customized industry. Um, so, I'm happy to take additional questions if anyone might have um, or any other thoughts. You know, many of you might work with firms that are either partnering with OCIOs or are 
those areas themselves. So any questions you have? Yes, back to something that you sure. mentioned earlier where uh, there's a generalist OCIO model, but then there are sleeves, assuming for sort of private yes. sort of OCIO for that sleeve. Um, in that scenario, how does that um, sleeve OCIO work with the rest of the portfolio? I mean, is, is there a difference with the customer consultant, the rest of the portfolio, and then just the private sleeves? sleeves OCIO. Right, so, so there's a couple of different ways that you might see this. So you'll see the OCIO is working um, on that portfolio themselves, but there's typically um, either an in house investment team that's going to interface with them. I don't know if you, Michelle, Michelle studied, Michelle has researched this as well, so I don't know if you have. No, no, that's right. So sometimes the um, institution or the client will come in and have some investment options. Work closely with the OCIO, but be responsible for managing the total portfolio. In other cases, um, if the OCIO is an investment consultant, um, they may have an advisory relationship on the majority of the portfolio, but then be asked to um, take discretion over a sleeve of the portfolio. Um, so they would probably with whatever internal resources, uh, investment resources <coughs> existed at the institution to kind of manage the total portfolio and bring that sleep uh, into managing the total portfolio. If somebody else has their hand raised. Yes, thank you. Great presentation. So all the stats here were US OCIO. So the 2.4 trillion market size in the US. What about international? So I think X X US. How would you size it up? So um so it's so country by country, first of all, is very important to the OCIO space. There's just too many regulations um and, and too many differences in terms of how the model is managed. But um right now, um we see that there's two other countries outside of the US that have sizable enough markets to look at, and that's going to be the UK and the Netherlands. So um, if you're familiar with the Netherlands, the Netherlands pretty much all of their, they have a very extensive um, pension system, and about, for a portion of them, about a portion that's just private firms, private organizations, almost all of that is managed via OCIO. Is managed by about the last time I checked, it was eight firms, <laughs> and that's slowly shrunk. It's all that they're very hyper local. They, the firms prefer to work with, um, with other Dutch firms, so um, it's you know, over the years, we've actually seen some of the more global firms move out of that market because it was too difficult. You know, there are some global markets that do that, but it's if you're looking as an the current OCIO to, to grow business there, it's probably not a smart decision unless you are yourself um, a, a Dutch asset manager. Uh, the UK is a little bit different. Like, uh, it, it's far more um, open. It's managed mostly by investment consultants and it's growing pretty quickly. 15% um, per year. The last time I tracked it was maybe 20 years ago. Um, it's mostly, um, it's, it's almost all DC and DP plans. Um, you know, there were, so the, the financial conduct authority there um, implemented some performance-based standards, which were a little bit easier to do, and they did that with the help of the CFA. Much easier to do in the UK simply because you're only working with, um, with pensions and defined contribution plans than it is in the US where you're working with the So, um, again, that's mostly covered by uh, the UK or the large global. Yeah, thank you. What is the addressable market? What's the addressable market? Yeah, I'm not too sure. Sure. So the addressable market in the UK is I would have to look at the exact number, but I want to say it's about I don't have the number off the top of my head. Apologies. Um the, the addressable market in the Dutch is I would consider it quite Thank you. Yes. In the UK you're have the 12 conversations with search consultants. Yes. Are there any topics that are top of mind for them or any themes 
I think the topic that I heard the most really was around the number of people coming there for placements, which is this year. That was that was fun sense. They had a lot of people coming to them asking, should we be moving to San Diego? In most cases, their answer was no. <laughs> they did occasionally say yes, but in most cases, they tried to get the client to focus on making changes and educating them about why it was was that mainly on performance concerns? It was both, yeah. Yeah, so it was somewhat performance concerns, but it also, I would, there was an element of we've just been in this for quite a bit and we need to know what else is out there, but more, more performance and then just risk exposure. Does, do they understand what this means? Or do they have the capabilities to help us with that? Um, again, it was, you know, risk risk exposure was just not a concern. There were a lot of these firms that were able to meet their their benchmarks or returns and stuff that now that it is there. Yes. Regarding ESG, it sounds like the the OCIOs have the capabilities, but many of the clients using OCIOs are not yet too concerned about it. Is that correct? Well they it's not that they're not concerned. Michelle is actually um, also publishes our ESG research, so I've, I've done so many of them. Okay, so we do a separate survey, um, a separate ESG sur or ESG survey that reaches out to about two hundred institutional assets, and I want to say um, somewhere under. I think 14% of those institutions are in the area. Um, and the types of support that they generally, institutions generally seek from a third party around ESG is support with manager research and selection, or support with developing an investment policy to reflect how they're going to consider ESG information. So would it be through evaluating managers on their ESG integration process and how they're considering ESG-related risks, um, or um, you know, would they like to incorporate a sleep of the portfolio that focuses on ESG-type investments like um, climate solutions or an area that they're passionate about that may, that may align with their mission. So what we've heard is that typically and historically, um, nonprofit institutions that are mission aligned will you know, reflect uh, ESG in a number of different ways. But when you open it up to the broader universe of institutional investors, um, it still remains a small piece. Some um, also mentioned that they are seeking education from born around the topic. Um, and when you look at how long the broader universe has been reflecting ESG considerations on average, it's seven years. But if you kind of dig into those numbers a little bit more, mission aligned institutions have been doing for decades. So you know, to unpack it, um, what I would say is a majority of the support is around investment policy development um, for those that are looking to invest, um, manager selection, manager research, um, and then the education piece. Well, I wanted to thank everyone. I know we're at time. Uh, please, if you have any questions, you can talk to the CFA. And, um, it's a, have a, a lovely afternoon, everyone. Thank you.